for you. So money and children and properties in this world, they are the good things in this life. And God tells us what is better than that. Like I mentioned in the last khutbah, worshiping God alone and nourishing your real person, the Quran says is much better than owning everything on this earth and twice as much. All the real estate in Vancouver and New York All the real estate in the whole world, all the oil, the gold, the diamonds. Believing in God alone and feeding, nourishing your real person is much better when you have the right perspective, is much better than owning everything on earth and twice as much. So this verse 46 of Surah 18 says, money and children are the beauties or the good, the good things of this world, but the righteous works that last forever are far better and provide better hope, wa khayrun amala. The end of the verse is khayrun amala. There is better hope in them. There is no hope in the properties. Rock Hudson was very famous and very rich. George Liberati's mansion still, you can go as a tourist and look at it. But he's not there. Because there's something better that could, he could have acquired. That is righteous works. And developing his soul in order to withstand life next to God in the hereafter. If he didn't develop his soul, he will not stand being close to God. And the verse 47 says, because the day will come when we remove the mountains and you see the earth uh, barren, everything will go. And then we will gather every single one. The Arabic says, فَلَمْ نُغَادِرْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا we will, never, we will not leave a single person. God says we're going to gather everybody to, for this reckoning. How much did you do for, for this vanishing garment? How much did you do for yourself? The reckoning is going to be automatic. But every single one will come to account. The next verses go on and describe why the righteous works and feeding your soul is the Number one priority, that when you do anything else, it's a waste of time. Anything else that does not develop your soul is a waste of time. And missing a Friday prayer, I'm missing this because you're all here, when you miss a Friday prayer for any reason, it's a terrible, terrible loss. Because being once a week a congregational prayer which you meet your brothers and sisters, and it's a, it's a commandment from God to do this, when you miss it, you miss a lot. I mean, I cannot put it in billions of dollars. We have to have, the, we always remember the right perspective. And the advice in Quran is to commemorate, to commemorate God 24 hours a day, every chance you get. You can turn your work into worship. Yeah, you can take the mail from the fellow. Open it. He has a express mail thing. And I need it. <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> These are papers that, that I need. It's one o'clock, so I'm going to read uh, some material and uh, some kind of a quiz. I want you to find out or think where it is from, okay? Every addition or omission of a word or even of a single letter from the sacred text of the prayers destroys the religious meaning of the prayer as a whole and is to be regarded as a grave sin a sin which could result in eternal exile for those who commit it remember there are certain statements in Quran says why lunil musallin woe to those who are doing their prayer I mean those are people who are doing their prayer but they end up in the negative because they are heedless of their prayers or because there are other reasons. So you must make sure that your prayer is perfect. Your salat, your, your contact, I'm, I'm not talking about supplications. I'm talking about your contact prayers. It is a recognized statement in Quran, وَيْلٌ لِلْمُسَلِّينَ Woe to those who are doing the salat prayer. الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَهُونَ Who are heedless of their prayers. They are not aware 
or they are neglecting something. Let me read this again. And I wanted to apply it to our contact prayer here. See, Barry is visiting us for the first time and he will wonder why do we do the prayer in Arabic? And why this particular prayer, for example? And all of us ask this question. In fact, it's going to come up. So let me read this again. Every addition or omission of a word or even a single letter. Now, we in this mosque fully appreciate the mathematical composition of everything that's connected with our worships, the, the Quran, and even our, the bones in our body and everything else. So we should appreciate what is written here. Every addition or omission of a word or even of a single letter from the sacred text. Al-Fatiha is the sacred text that God gave us. The first surah of Quran. We cannot add anything to it. As you know, Satan succeeded everywhere in the Muslim world. They add the word Amin. And our people in Washington, D.C. have a radio program, and I have one of the tapes here talking about this Amin. And they got it from the, uh, the dictionary, some recognized dictionary, and they read what Amin is. Turns out to be an old Hebrew, Greek, something word that has nothing to do with Arabic. It is not in the Quran. But here, this is why Satan tricked the people into adding it. Every addition or omission of a word or even a single letter from the sacred text of the prayers destroys the religious meaning of the prayer as a whole and is to be regarded as a grave sin. So here is a person doing the prayer, committing a grave sin. Okay, let me go to another section. As I go, you will guess what I'm reading from. He and his disciples evolved a mystical theory, according to which the words and letters of the various prayers are not accidental, nor are they only vehicles for which literal, for their literal meaning. I mean, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim, guide us in the right path. It's wonderful. But we are not saying the contact prayer for this literal meaning. There is much more to it. So listen, listen to this. Nor are they only vehicles for their literal meaning. Their order, and especially their numbers, we certainly appreciate that, reflect a mystical harmony, a, sec a sacred divine rhythm. Next. No change can be tolerated in the text of the prayers, not even a minute one, because every change, even of one letter, would destroy the numerical harmony inherent in the text. So every letter that God composed in the first surah of Quran, Al-Fatiha, is numerically controlled. The sounds, when you say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, this is composed by God for a specific reason, a combination that causes your contact with your Creator. So listen, it's, it's coming up. It does not matter, therefore, whether the change is beneficial from the point of view of meaning and content. I mean, you may think of composing a Shakespearean, excellent, literary marvel that praises God. It doesn't mean a thing. Forget it. It is not the meaning we're after. It's the numerical composition and the sounds. For this level of meaning is not the most important one in the prayers. The text was formed by God. I'm adding this by God. To reflect mystical harmony and any change would destroy it. The second point here is the liturgy, that is the contact prayers, Al-Fatiha. The liturgy received new importance and new meaning within the framework of religious practice after discovering the numerical importance of it. A completely new dimension was added in this way to the daily prayer service. It stopped being just a a reciting of requests and praises of God in ancient formulas, Arabic, for example, and became a vehicle for becoming a participant in a mystical divine harmony. The prayers suddenly received a new depth of meaning and importance, which was undreamed of in the thousand years that had passed since they were formulated. Next. Okay, this will really tell you what this is coming from. The quiz becomes easier and easier. 
The fierce polemical tone of Rabbi Judah's criticism of the changes introduced by the Frenchmen in the prayers can therefore be explained as a result of his fear that the prayers may be regarded as completely human in origin and meaning, making them secular and meaningless in religious and mystical practices. A lot of people accuse me of being harsh with some people who are making changes in the prayers or in the Quran or in the practices of religion. But uh, there is a precedent. It is fear for these people and it is concern for them. According to him, even if the content and meaning of the prayer is religious, expressing love and devotion to God, it still will be just, quote, a secular song like that of, of the non-Jews. If it does not have the added mystical dimension of hidden truth, which cannot be revealed by the literal meaning of the words alone. In his polemic, Rabbi Judah does not defend only the specific tradition of prayer which he received, from his parents and teachers, he also defends prayer as an elevating force, forming a connection between connection, salat, a connection between man and God, a connection that no mere words can achieve. So it's not just the words, there's a numerical uh, <coughs> mysticism in it. And the last section, all God-fearing people, when they pray, have to direct their prayers when they say, blessed is God, alhamdulillah, when they say, quote unquote, blessed is God, and when they kneel before him and thank him and direct their prayers in their hearts only to his holiness alone, within which is his glory and which has neither form nor image. We direct it to God alone. Atim salah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله